Thank you. Well, I, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I think this might be the third time I've, I've lectured to, uh, to this group. Uh, but um, this is the, the first time uh, in person. So it's, it's really nice to, uh, it's really nice to be, really nice to be in person. One thing on the land acknowledgement, um, for those of you who have interest, there's a, there's a tremendous book called An Inconvenient Indian by uh, Thomas King. And I always mention that when there's a land acknowledgement because it's, it's good to uh, have that land acknowledgement, um, but it's good to do some of your own reading. That's a really powerful, uh, disturbing, and very funny uh, book. So if you're looking to explore that aspect of our history, that's a, that's a, that's a great one. Um, so, uh, yeah, really delighted to be here. Now, I guess, um, I want to start with a bit of challenge I'm, I'm, I'm having. So I'm, I'm, a, I suppose I'm, I'm a, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but I really love my blackberry. And this is one of the, this is one of the classic blackberries with the, with the, with the keypads. I've just, you know, the rolling thing on the, have you guys seen one of these before? It's, it, the problem is it died on me. So it's, I got to get a new, I got to get a new phone and it's, it's upsetting. I've had this for like, I don't know, 15, 20 years almost. So um, this is a young crowd, technologically savvy. So um, I need a little bit of help before we start the lecture. Um, and that'll be the little quid pro quo. You'll help me out and then I'll give you the lecture. Um, so I understand that there's lots of new phones. There's an Apple phone. There's something called an Android. Who's got an Apple phone here? What, what number is it? 14? Oh, that's, I understand... 12. Okay. Is anyone, can anyone beat a 12? I understand there's like a 13, 14. It's 12. No one's got more. You got a 13? Okay. We're going to do a little bidding here. Do I hear 14? 15. Okay. All right. I don't think it's anything other than a 15, right? So what did, what did you, what did you pay for that 15? Yeah. Yeah. How much did it cost? Seventeen hundred for a phone. That's a that's a lot of money. Um, who's got a cheaper phone than seventeen hundred? The Androids, I understand, are a little less expensive. Back of the room. What's that? Eight. Oh, the SE. Okay, is. But how much is it? Yeah, 150 bucks. Okay, so does is, is anyone have that phone? All right, what about the Androids? Anyone have an Android? What'd you pay for yours? Uh, I believe it's about 800 for the Android, but the Google is Okay. Uh, anyone else have an Android? I saw another hand up here. What, yes, how much did you pay for yours? $700. Now we're talking. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody cheaper than $700? Yes. Uh, tell me, like, years ago? Yes. So are you still using it? Yeah. Fabulous. It's called a show me. Show me. Okay. Uh, $400. And it was, uh, so I wonder if it's more expensive or less expensive. Let's just go with, let's just go with that. Um, okay. What does the phone do? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what it does. You paid for it. You're, you're getting something from it. What is, what does it do? Calls, calls, texts, Wi-Fi connection, camera, social media. Wow. Sound recording, music, music. Uh, reading books. Like it'll read for you or your no, e-books. E -books. Okay, so it provides you books. Okay, what else? Okay, I'm liking that phone. I'm liking that phone. You've got the 15. Okay, so so you can see what the what the what the, what was it called again? The show, Xiaomi. 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 The Xiaomi phone. That sounds pretty cool. I think I might pick up one of those on the way home. Can you 
what 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 is what is the seventeen hundred dollar phone do that this one doesn't? Okay. Okay. So what what is it? What's the difference? The camera is the camera. I take a picture. Editing. Okay. Uh, and that's the whole idea there is they have a lot of AI built into it to kind of help them with various things. Right. Uh, namely, like transcribing when they're doing a lot of exercises and they want to record, stuff like that. So it's a lot of extras. Okay. That you would or would not be coming up with with a or a Okay. Very cool. All right. Anything else? Yes. There's also the integration of the iPhone and the Mac with the web browser. Integration. Um, Mac integration. I never got Macs. They're confusing. They're irritating. I use, you know, I get other things, but the, yeah. What, yes? The integrated ones have uh, the higher frame rate, right? So if you have higher one, frame rates? Yeah, one frame. So it's very easy to see on it. So you can just program it, right? Very fast. And it's like not like any competition or like not um, breaking or anything. Fast scrolling, okay. Anything else? So I guess uh, the option that our friend pointed to is too, you can generalize and generalize it to the ecosystem app a little bit. The people are pretty smart. The ecosystem. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about that. Right? So you can make it. Oh, oh with the different devices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or, yeah? Okay. More on the more on the uh, integration. We'll we'll keep that out of the the integration. So yes. I see that I hold my laptop and my yes. Okay. But you you can take notes and stuff. Can you? Yeah. 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 See, I'm 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 kind of a I'm kind of a bare basics. I don't want to pay for all the extras. That's that's a lot of money for a phone. So I think I mean you guys have done a nice description on some of the the extras, but I, honestly, I'm I'm now I'm gonna now <laughs> okay one more what. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I got. A, I had a friend who got a got an Apple Watch, and and it couldn't connect to his phone because his phone was too old. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I'm I, I'm gonna tell you I I'm on my way home I'm I'm gonna buy one of these because 400 bucks you know basics it does everything that I want this this stuff sounds nice but. Uh, so, um, so what we've just done is is a is an analysis of of costs, and the the point of this is that this is exactly what payers are doing. If you have a new drug, if you have a new medical device, if you have a diagnostic, payers are, are sitting in a room and they're doing the same analysis. Now, there's some really cool nomenclature and if you guys want to be one you know the cool kids in the class you gotta you gotta learn this nomenclature which is all about health economics it's in the in the basket of health economics but bottom line this is all they're doing they're saying okay what what is one versus another what does this do you want to charge me more well what do i get for that it's it's a it's a it's an analysis uh of of value and what they do in in what they call it in health economics is a health technology assessment. So we've done a technology assessment. All they do in health economics is do a, a, a health 
uh, technology assessment, very same thing. We do this every every day. You guys probably don't even know it, but when you go to the grocery store and you're you're gonna buy some uh, chicken for for dinner, do you buy the breasts or do you buy the legs? Now, legs are cheaper. There's more bone. It's a little bit more work, but chicken breasts are really expensive. So how do I how do I value that extra? What am I getting for that extra money? Maybe I'm getting more meat. Maybe I'm getting a time savings. There's a there's an economic valuation. Everything we do, simple as, as going to the grocery store, we're we're doing that um, we're doing that economic analysis, and that's all that's done in in uh, health technology assessment. Now for the folks on Zoom, welcome. I'll try and stay within uh, within uh, camera zone. Um, so we're talking about um, we're talking about uh, groceries. Uh, I guess I'm going to click this. Is that there we go. Um, so we're talking about groceries. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that I love uh, food basics because you can get really good deals. It's not as nice a store, but I feel like I get good value uh, for money. But uh, today what we're going to do is, is we're going to do a reimbursement uh, basics. Now, um, unfortunately, there's a difference in the, um, uh, in the Windows uh, version that I use versus what, what the Sunnybrook has. So you'll see some oddities in the in the uh, um, in some of the slides that's what it's from so just uh, just ignore that if you will um, so we're going to do reimbursement basics and uh, the first thing I want to ask you guys is uh, who is this fellow anybody oh are you allowed to answer I don't think you I don't know I don't know we'll come back to you so I got one person who knows all right, so we'll give we'll give a hint. Um, he's a was a Baptist minister. No, okay. Um, he was a politician. Uh, okay, who watches? Um, what's it called? Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor is that? Yeah, twenty four. No, I'm getting confused. Look, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland. Does that name ring a bell? He's an actor. He's about my age, so maybe you guys don't know who he is. Uh, that's his. That's his grandfather. Okay. No. Anybody? All right. All right. So when you got, who's been to, uh, who, who's, who is, uh, who went to see the doctor lately? Anybody? Yes. You went to see the doctor lately. And so when you left the doctor's office, how much, how much did you pay? What did you? How much did you? Did you? Uh, maybe they took cash or credit card. What? What's? No, didn't you didn't pay anything. It was free. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's because of this guy. So this is Tommy Douglas. Uh, so it's not strictly because of him, but he was the uh, impetus behind uh, public health care in Canada. He was the premier of Saskatchewan. He started it uh, in Saskatchewan, then went on to become uh, the federal um, uh, NDP leader. May have been the CCF at the time, but in any case, the federal NDP leader. Uh, and uh, as the NDP has often done, pressured the government to uh, adopt one of their policies, and in this case, it was it was Medicare. So, so when you go to the doctor, you're not uh, paying. The folks in this hospital are not getting bills because uh, of Tommy Douglas and that movement to create a um, uh, to create a um, uh, to create a, a public uh, uh, health care system. Now, I I say that it's it's important because. Um, does anyone here have a, have a startup at this point? Has anyone started a company? Yes. A little bit. Who, who wants to have, who wants to start a company? Yeah. A few more hands. Okay. All right. So all you need to, to have a startup is a problem and a solution and a customer. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that today because it's the customer that intersects with with reimbursement. We'll talk about what a little bit about what reimbursement is. Um, but before that, uh, I want somebody to tell me. Uh, did you know it was Keith or someone? By the way, did you know it was Tommy Douglas? Okay. So you're lucky. I was at Costco yesterday, so got a whole box. So when I ask a question. 
if you guys have the right answer, I've got lots more, and I don't want to take them home. So do you like coffee, Chris? Is it Kit Kat? No, it's good. Okay, all right. Kit Kats, coffee crisps, arrow bars. Um, okay, what, what's what's going on here? We got a what, what's why do I have this picture of a yeah butterfly effect? Precisely, what is the butterfly effect? Can you define it for us? Right. Right. And that something else can be really, really big. And so a small thing can have a huge impact over time. You like Kit Kats? You like? There you go. Um, uh, box says 18, but my wife got into this. So this, <laughs> there's no, and my son, so there's no longer 18, but there are a few. Um, okay, so, so it, with uh, every lecture I give, I try and give a, a course takeaway because in three years' time, You'll remember, yeah, I think it was at some lecture for uh, reimbursement. And this is the thing that I want you to remember, and it is this, uh, understand your impact. Um, anyone want to hazard a guess about what I'm trying to get at with understand your impact? You've got a medical device, you've got a, uh, it could be a therapeutic diagnostic, it's really, it doesn't matter. What's the, what am I getting at here? Now, someone else, because we've already, you've already got a, you can get the kick. It depends on your answer. Yep. Yep. Value is, is, is part of it. Uh, so, so talk more about the impact though. So great. So, Yeah, you're, you're, you're getting at it. It's, 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 it's good enough for a Kit Kat. Yeah. Um, uh, and I don't have any small ones, so there's no, there's no half, uh, there's no half marks. Um, so, um, understand your impact. Yes. It's, it's about patience. Yeah. Do you have some other thoughts? Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's mainly about this idea of how many people help with, and kind of alleviate pressure from different parts of the system, more or less. So, Okay. Describe that pressure. Pressure or so what? Idea, what pressure? If you have, like, let's say, hypothetically, a thousand patients, and they only have ten doctors to see them, if your solution can take away maybe five hundred patients, or essentially solve the problem for five hundred of those thousand, then you have basically half the pressure on your side. Right. Okay. So you're you're having an impact on physicians. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yeah, fabulous. You said the magic word stakeholders. What do you, you Kit Kat, uh, Arrow, or Coffee Crisp? Coffee Crisp, yeah, that's that's my favorite too. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's about patients, it's about physicians, it's, it's about all stakeholders. And, and you mentioned something really interesting. Uh, you talked about primary stakeholders, but it's, it's, it's beyond that. And you talked about, talk, talked about the environment. Um, if, if you're impacting the environment, then it's potential you've got a broader base of stakeholders. So really the, the, the message here is it understand your impact. If you understand Everyone that you're going to have in every group that you're going to have an impact on patient groups, certainly doctors, uh, uh, potentially the, there's a, a, the political side. Uh, maybe you, you do something for bureaucrats. Maybe you make their life easier. Maybe you do something for nurses. If you understand all the impacts you're going to have in the ecosystem, it's going to be a really easy thing to build a reimbursement plan. You won't necessarily have a good case but it'll be really easy to build the plan, right? So that's why understand your impact is, is so important. Um, do, do, have you guys done regulatory? Do you know what a medical device is? Yeah, so it's, um, th this is the legal definition. It's, it's used to help a patient and it's not a drug. That's my definition of, of a medical device. I try to simplify things. 
If you like, if you want to read the Food and Drugs Act to get the exact definition, uh, you're welcome to. Um, and you guys understand that from a regulatory perspective, it's, it's based on risks, the different classes, um, and uh, very similar in the US and, and the UK. Um, uh, and that's important because, of course, if you don't get regulatory approval, uh, you don't have much of a you don't have much of a company. So that's kind of the, the, the first step. Um, so what what is reimbursement? What, what is somebody help me out with that? Just define it for me. Who paid? Who said that? You said that? Oh, you already got a chocolate bar. And you want another one? <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's exactly, it's exactly the right answer is who pays for it, right? So, and that's why when we get into that, okay, I got a problem and I got a solution. So, and the, and the gap between those two things is really big. So I've got a really interesting company on my hands. Well, who's going to pay for it? And that is a critical, critical question. And really the question we're dealing with uh, today. So in, in, in the context, when we talk about reimbursement, we're normally talking about somebody other than the patient. Um, pays the bill. So if we get reimbursement, it means some organization is paying. If we didn't get reimbursement, it falls on the patient. That's the basic the basic dynamic. Okay. So now here's here's the uh, here's the model uh, for for optimal reimbursement. You can see at the bottom Health Canada approval. We touched on that very briefly. Uh, the concept of regulatory approval. Um, and this this works regardless of, of uh, jurisdiction. So in, in the states, it's the FDA, uh, but there is that Health Canada approval that is is uh, founded on. And then we're going to put some pillars on this foundation, and that's going to create the uh, ability to to have a very strong and solid roof. In other words, a strong reimbursement case. Yes. Software as a medical device, therapeutics, diagnostics. It's it's really the same. It's really the same principle. The same uh, lever. The same pillars uh, are going to be important. You're going to need, uh, regardless of where you are in the life sciences sector, you're going to need some kind of healthcare. Even if it's even even if it's a uh, class one, uh, you, you still need approval. It's very easy to get approval for class one. You just write a letter saying we're selling it, and they say okay, thanks. Um, nonetheless, it, it it is required, right? On top of that, you put that health technology assessment. So we did the phone example, uh, talked about chicken. Uh, we can talk about drugs and medical devices. There is a formal process of health technology assessment. There's also an informal process that we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Um, but that health technology assessment, that recommendation from whatever body that's doing it, can be very important. It's required in drugs. So every single drug will get health care approval, then they'll get um, health technology assessment, and then they'll go on to, to try and get reimbursement. Medical devices, very, very fuzzy. We're going to talk about that, that fuzziness. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges with this area is that it's really, there's not one pathway, there's dozens of different pathways to get medical devices approved. Uh, It's it's not so much steps as it is a snapshot of of what you need to, to consider the, the pieces. Yeah, let me let me get through it and then you, if if it's confusing at all, then then um, stick up your hand and we'll we'll clarify it. So on top of Health Canada approval, regulatory approval, we have the health technology assessment and then we have our four pillars. Okay, now we got our value offering. So I was talking about that earlier about you got a problem, you got a solution. Okay, there's your value offering. That's that's what you're bringing to the table. Uh, and if there is a problem, and then inherent in that problem is that the standard of care, whatever's being used now, is is not sufficient. You're making an improvement upon what else is being done. You know, maybe there's nothing for these patients, and so therefore that gap is really big. Uh, it maybe it's an improvement. On, uh, on an existing technology. So there's an incremental benefit, value offering, that distance between problem and solution may be a bit smaller. Um, so that's the value offering. What value are you bringing to the, to the table? What value are you bringing to patients? What value are you bringing to physicians? What value are you bringing to the environment? All of those stakeholders, there's bits of value 
that you will you will be applying because of course if you're changing their world in any case in any way then uh, then they're a stakeholder right okay so that's a value offering strength of data strength of data um, if I tell you that my medical device is going to save patient lives you'll be super impressed and you'll want to pay for it but you're probably going to say give some proof it sounds great but you want me to pay a lot of money so can you show me some data and that's all that is and that's the strength of your data so if you've got really strong data if you can put the value offering on the table and you can say here's the data that proves it and it's high quality data great you've got two really strong pillars okay third one level of advocacy uh, anyone want to take a stab at what i mean by level of advocacy awareness Yeah, you, you're on the right. You're on the right track. You mentioned stakeholders earlier. Yes. Yes, that that in essence is is what we're talking about. That's worth that's worth the chocolate bar. What are, what are you, uh, Kit Kats? Okay, I like Kit Kats too. Um, um, so, um, so advocacy is, is just that, but apply it to all stakeholders. So if I have a new medical device and I have got physicians at Sunnybrook where there's a clinical champion, somebody who is maybe the head of a department who say, who is, loves this medical device and wants to get into the hospital, he's your champion. He's an advocate. And all of a sudden your reimbursement pillar just strengthened because as we'll talk about most medical devices are actually purchased by hospitals so if you've got a clinical champion in a hospital and he's advocating for it that's fantastic if you've got patient groups that are advocating for it okay that's fantastic if there's an economic value in there if there's an environmental uh, value in there and you've got some environmental components that are advocating for this then you're strengthening that pillar Anywhere where you can get advocacy for your, your medical device. And again, doesn't matter, vaccines, uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, level of advocacy is, is going to lift up and strengthen your, your building here. And then support or alignment with government priorities. That's a little bit fuzzier. I'll give you an example, though. Um, recently, uh, in the last couple of years, we've had uh, lineups for uh, waiting um, lines for... Uh, uh, for orth orthopedic surgery, and so the government dumped money, uh, dumped money into. It. Actually, a more recent example is is family physicians. So I was hearing some crazy numbers, like 25% of Canadians don't have a family physician. That's just that's extraordinary. It's crazy. So anything you can do, I'm, I'm involved with one uh, one startup through my um, consulting that um, is involved in um, AI. Uh, everything is AI these days, uh, and for good reason. So it's it's AI, and and the concept is that a physician will, um, the computer will record the conversation, and then all his charting is done. Physicians spend an inordinate amount of time filling out forms and charting, and this the promise of this technology, again the value offering, is that they just have the interview in in the room, and then. It, all their forms and, and charting is, is magically done by, uh, by AI. So if you're making the family physician more efficient, government's gonna be very interested in that. So that strengthens your, that's your pillar. So we've got four pillars. We've got value offering, strength of data, level of advocacy, and then support or alignment with government priorities. And then on top of that, we have our reimbursement. So the stronger those pillars, the more likely it is we're gonna get reimbursement. So that's central to this. Is any questions? Is that clear? Could be, yes. Yeah, this is very general. So, yeah, you're right. So, we'll get into billing codes a little bit later. There may be 
a path that's already taken by somebody else and you're improving on the technology and so therefore it's a little bit maybe easier uh, if it's completely new you may have more of a, of a challenge but but unfortunately it's it depends it depends it depends there's so many different dynamics for for medical devices that it's it, it's impossible to, to to give you one answer on that Yes, you're right. And what has become a truism in the last um, last 10 years, maybe slightly longer, is that um, there are two barriers to commercialization. One is regulatory approval and two is reimbursement. And de depending on the medical device uh, that or drug or which, whatever it is, it, it, it may kill the kill the business if you can't get reimbursement. We're going to talk about different examples. And so it's not always the case, um, but it, it's a critical piece. So yes, to your point, early startups should be thinking about reimbursement uh, when they're creating their data because the regulators are going to ask for their data. Uh, but if it's a medical de device, they're not going to ask for much data. In, in, in the medical case of medical devices, the health technology assessment may actually ask for more uh, more data than they um, more data than they um, um, than the regulators. Yes. So these, um, the, the stronger these pillars, the stronger the likelihood that you will get reimbursement. Yeah, it, um, so you see this a lot with drugs that, uh, and, and it, to some extent, um, we'll get into group purchasing organizations. There is a mechanism to negotiate price. And so, yes, love your medical device. Um, we're not paying two thousand. We'll pay a thousand. What do you think about that? Okay. So yes, you're right. There is that 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 uh, negotiation uh, negotiation aspect. Um, any questions online yet? No. Okay. All right. Good. Um, okay. We're gonna do it for those of you uh, who's sticking around for the case study afterwards. Yeah, a few. So just to give you a heads up, as you go through this, um, uh, we're going to be um, just have these questions in mind because it's it's what we're going to work on afterwards. So those are the four four pillars. So we're going to want to want to think about those four pillars as we're thinking about. In this case, it's an I stand, which is um, and we'll give you a quick uh, lesson on uh, on uh, ophthalmology and glaucoma, but it's for glaucoma and it's a little in essence, a little a tube that's stuck in your eye to, to help the uh, eye drain uh, and therefore lower the pressure in the eye, which is the, the main cause of glaucoma. That's a wild oversimplification, but that's that's in essence what it is. And so we're going to talk about the value offering. And, and in order to build that plan, we need to understand what's the value offering, uh, where does the eye stent fit into the HDA 2x2 matrix, that won't mean anything to you right now, but we'll get into that shortly. Uh, who are your stakeholders, right? We talked about the importance of stakeholders and how are they impacted and then support or alignment with government priorities. So what, why, why is the government going to care? Maybe they don't, maybe they're not going to, in which case you don't have that pillar. Um, but we're going to, we're going to ask, uh, we're going to ask about that. So that's the, that's the case study. Um, there's a couple of other things that you, this is, this is the human element because there's always a human element in this. You, you can create a great um, uh, reimbursement plan, but humans are humans. So you will find that there may be biases. You may find that the change you're proposing is it's not in my interest. Uh, there was a time when radiologists thought AI was a bad thing. Uh, now they're embracing it, and it turns out, oh, it's a really good thing for radiologists. Um, Resistance to change, that's a very natural human thing. And we're going to talk about billing codes as well, because uh, that's a really important, uh, can be a very important factor. So these, these sit outside the model. Uh, these, that's the, the human element uh, that, you need to, uh, that you need to think about. So just a quick snapshot on, um, uh, on medical devices. Uh, it, it's a big market. 
so $419 billion uh, globally. It's about a quarter of drugs. The drugs are massive. Medical devices are, are relatively small, but still big market. In Canada, that, that's about seven and a half billion. And the Canadian market, uh, pretty much across life sciences, is about 2%, 2% of the world market. And you can see that compared to global to Canada, it's pretty much the same uh, breakdown in terms, of, in terms of category. U.S. is the largest market by far in any uh, health-related thing. Um, and I th you guys probably are aware of that. Drugs, for example, 50% of the market is, is not 50% of the drugs. They pay a lot for their drugs. So 50% of the market, the dollars, uh, are in the U.S., and similarly, 42% uh, uh, of, the, of, of the global dollar market for medical devices is the U.S. So if you guys are thinking about startups, um, you're going to want to think about um, being in the U.S. Uh, so now let's get into a little bit more detail. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the strength of data and the value offering um, uh, and, and the health technology assessment because inherent, those are really, those three things are, are tied together. Um, and we're going to do a quick snapshot on health economics. So this is, this is health economics in a slide. Uh, and as I say, I'll, I'll throw a bit of nomenclature at you um, so that you can be one of the cool kids when you talk about uh, health technology assessment. So determining the cost of the system versus what the patient gets. Uh, so this is a, a very simple two by two matrix. Uh, on the Y axis is uh, cost difference. So you've got, what is that standard of care? How much does that cost? So we've got, uh, we've got the uh, $400 phone. Uh, that's a nice standard of care. Actually, the BlackBerry was a standard of care, I suppose, but it broke. So we'll call the, uh, the $400 one standard of care. You're coming to me with a $1,700 iPhone. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty significant difference in cost. So um, great, you're gonna, you're gonna charge more. So let's, let's measure the effectiveness. This is quite theoretical because it can be very difficult to measure effect effectiveness. Um, but uh, but that's the, the theory is that you have the effectiveness uh, of standard of care versus the uh, effectiveness of, of the new intervention. Um, and then there are four quadrants. Uh, and number one is you are costing more money, uh, but you're more effective. Hmm. So are we cost effective in that in that case? We don't really know. It could be, but maybe you're charging a lot of money and we're only getting a little value. So that's, uh, that's, that's a bit of a head scratcher. So we don't quite know there. Number two, more money, but you're less effective. Is that cost effective? No, we don't need a health technology assessment to know that, that that's okay. Why am I gonna pay more money for something that's less? No, no, that's not cost effective. Number three, less money. Oh, you're cheaper. Okay, I like that. Oh, but you're less effective. Hmm. Is it cost effective? Yeah, we don't know. That's a bit of a head scratcher as well. Could be, maybe, uh, but we don't know. Uh, and then there is uh, number four, where you're uh, less money, uh, you're less money, but uh, uh, more, uh, you're more effective. That's an easy one, right? Um, Greater money, less effective. Yes, that's the one where it's cost effective. That's obviously cost effective. That's obviously not cost effective. And so what healthy economists do is just draw that line. Um, and 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 this is this is really the question. Now, if you're if you're a medical device, you you don't want to be less expensive and 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 less effective. I mean, that's just not a, that's not a market you want to play in. So most most innovation is going to be more expensive. And the promise, at least, the value offering is going to be that it's more effective. So that's most of the time. That's where uh, that's where we're we're playing. Um, and the top uh, is is considered uh, not cost effective, and the bottom side is considered cost effective. Make sense? Yes. For the most part, yes. Now, this is this is used. Um, uh, the, the health technology assessment in in drugs is very very well developed, so that the whole health economics world is really focused on drugs. Increasingly, it's focused on medical devices, but they're harder to they're harder to deal with. They come to the table with less data, 
there's new things like software. How do you how do you evaluate that? So it's a real challenge. Um, but yes, this certainly theoretically it applies. I mean, look, this this could apply to the grocery store if you want it. It's 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 really just a, a very uh, in depth and detailed way of of looking at a cost analysis. Uh, and so here we get into some of some of the nomenclature. So this is a cost effective analysis, um, and in this um, in this particular case, this is actually measuring uh, incremental cost effective ratio. Now nobody calls it incremental cost effective ratio. If you want to be one of the cool kids, you call it the ICER. So you hear people talk about the ICER this and the ICER that. This is this is what they're talking about. So what is your ICER? Um, and then there's a cost benefit analysis that will measure just the dollars, uh, and a cost utility analysis, uh, which will be non-financial. Um, and this is the other key measure. Cost utility analysis measures quality adjusted life year. And again, you want to be one of the cool kids. You don't call it quality adjusted life year. You call it the quality. So you got your ICER and you got your quality. Now, quality adjusted life year. Anyone want to take a stab at what the hell a quality adjusted life year is? Yes? Uh, how long it's going to be effective for? Yes. Yeah, there's an element in there, but I'm going to say no, that's not the right answer. Yes? Uh, increase in quality of year. Almost. Yes, you're almost there. Uh, and and stick in perfect health, and and then you've got your answer. Yeah. So it's it's the it's the measure. Uh, it's how much does it cost to give me a perfect uh, a life a, a year of perfect health. Um, and this is economists, so it's it's silly. It doesn't really make any sense because it's a bunch of numbers. It's not human beings, but it's the way of they define it. And then health economists will, will take an arbitrary number. It comes from completely out of the air, $50,000. So that seems reasonable. So we'll pay $50,000 for one year of, of perfect health for you. Um, if, if it's going to cost more than $50,000, sorry, it's not cost effective. It goes above that line. If it costs now, and, and, then, it, and then furthermore, it depends on, um, on a disease state too. So um, we're more generous with cancer. So $100,000 is used in cancer. So it, it's really arbitrary. Um, so what's important to note here is that we there is this cost-effective analysis, that there's this thing called quality, uh, and it, it's 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 defined uh, by this matrix, which is which is the ICER. Okay? Yes. So are you measuring effectiveness? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's it. The cost is easy. Effectiveness is, is not easy. And that's, um, uh, yes, it could be, um, uh, it could be lives saved. It could be extension of life in the case of oncology treatments. Uh, it, that is, that is the tough part of this. And that's why, uh, many formal health technology assessments fall apart because they don't have the data to demonstrate the effectiveness. They've got the promise. And they might have some data, but or case studies, but it's not, you know, double-blind, randomized, clinically controlled. Um, so, uh, yeah, you've you've nailed the the, the challenge. Um, oh my gosh, who does HDA for medical devices? Um, my last count is 43. Anybody anybody watch or used to watch Gravity Falls? Gravity, you know, you know, Gravity, yeah, Gravity Falls, Uncle Stan, I love that show. Uh, so this is Grunkle Stan with his beside his bottomless pit. There's kind of a bottomless pit of uh, medical device reimbursement bodies. Sunnybrook has got to be on here somewhere, guaranteed. Um, not sure where, but guaranteed they are. So the the quick story is that uh, drugs are um, really the pathway to drugs and health technology assessment very well established. There's an organization called the Canadian Agency for Drugs, Technologies, and Health. Nobody calls it that. They all call it CADETH, and CADETH evaluates drugs, but they also evaluate um, medical devices increasingly. Um, uh, Health Quality Ontario is another good example, and in fact, we're, the, the, um, the, the, um, um, the case study 
uh, is going to um, is going to touch on that. So um, uh, one from Health Quality Ontario. Um, th there's so many that do uh, medical devices because it's tough to do. There's thousands of these versus um, a couple of hundred drugs a year. Um, the evidence is is not great with medical devices. Um, so we really haven't figured out a good way to do health technology assessment. Consequently, it's it's a little bit all over the place. And it's not mandatory, by the way, as well. Um, so uh, let's go back to level of advocacy. Um, stakeholders, yes. It is not mandatory. Yes, thank you for underlining that. Yes. So for drugs, it's absolutely mandatory. For medical devices, it is not mandatory. And so therefore, if you have a medical device, you're going to want to think about, okay, do I want to put it through one of those 43? It's a bit of a strategic decision. Do I do, and there are lots of reasons to get a, a health technology assessment versus not. Um, do I need it? It's expensive. Uh, it could be risky. Um, it could also help your reimbursement case. So you've got to make that assessment. Yeah. Uh, so what is a stakeholder? It's any, any group that's affected. And so those those are some of the some of some of the examples. Um, I've taken all of those, and um, we go back to understanding your impact. Uh, this is really where understanding your Im impact becomes super important. So this is the wheel of influence. Um, this is where the this is this is where you're going to have impact. These are the the big buckets, and within these buckets, there's lots of different um, lots of different folks. We've got economic stakeholders like. The Chamber of Commerce, for example, would be an economic stakeholder. If we, if we go clockwise, we get into political advisors, um, the, the politicians and their advisors as another set of stakeholders. Um, the bureaucracy. So we're going to give you a quick definition of what's the difference between the political and the bureaucracy. Uh, key opinion leaders. So these are physicians that are speaking at conferences and doing tons of, tons of um, uh, uh, write, writing tons of papers. They're cited. They're... Um, uh, others in the field look to them to see what they're doing. They're early adopters, key opinion leaders. Um, health uh, healthcare professional organizations like the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association, the Ontario Nurses Association, groups like that. The media is also a stakeholder, and then patient groups and, and advocates. So uh, this is uh, an exhaustive um, uh, um, picture of all the different stakeholders. And you have to be able to identify all the stakeholders in these groups um, in order to understand your impact uh, and therefore be able to create that messaging and create the advocacy. I call it a wheel of influence because, um, why do I call it a wheel of influence? Why is this a wheel of influence as opposed to a, I don't know what else you call it, but <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, I like that. Yes, that's not what I was thinking, but it's it's kind of related to that. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Yes. They do. It's it's a little bit different than that. It is that the media influences the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy can influence economic stakeholders. Economic stakeholders can uh, influence politicians. So it's the the influence is not just to the decision maker in the middle, but it's to other stakeholders. So a stakeholder can influence a stakeholder. In which in which case we so that we've got that link around the top, uh, which makes it round and and rolling. Uh, and so we we call it the the wheel of of influence. Um, I want to touch on briefly uh, support or alignment with um, with uh, government priorities. Who, who's, the, who's the guy on the left? I'm not giving a chocolate bar for this. Okay, I will. Who, someone who hasn't answered. Who's this guy on the left? Doug Ford. Okay, what's your what's your uh... Kit Kat? Okay, all right. Can you can you catch? I don't want to I don't want to hurt anybody here. Um, okay, two chocolate bars. If you can tell me who the person is on the right. Yeah, I think so. Three chocolate bars? Yeah. No, you're never going to guess. So, uh, and what I, I'm not even going to remember her name. Uh, and, um, Emanuela. Um, th th this is this is the point I'm making. Who, who knows? This is the this is the Secretary of Cabinet. Gotta like that title, Secretary of Cabinet. This is 
probably the most important, uh, most powerful person in government in Ontario. She's the head of the civil service. And you don't know her name because she's the head of the civil service. You're, you, you, uh, but, but very, very powerful. Um, and, and that takes me to the, my point about the difference between politicians and bureaucrats. It's important to know because they're a really important stakeholder. So you get, you get these people, and I've been one of them, say, God damn government? What the, what the government's not a monolith. The government is made up of all kinds of different ministries, all kinds of different people. And one of the basic divisions is political versus bureaucratic. So the politicians, these are the ones we see. We know their names. They get elected every four years or not. We kick them out. Their primary role is policy. They love to be in front of the camera. Uh, power with a question mark. Do they have power? Um, but there's about a thousand of them uh, in, in Ontario, politicians and staff. There's a couple hundred in the legislature, and then they've all got like a whole big staff. Uh, and they're the ones that, that actually govern. Bureaucracy is massive at 60,000 versus 1,000. Um, the ministry, uh, the ministries are, are aligned. So there'll be p politicians and bureaucrats in the Ministry of Health, for example. They have jobs for life. They administer. They stay in the shadows, uh, but they can be very powerful. So it's just, it's just a watch out to say, you know, if you think government's a stakeholder, okay, you got to be, you got to go way, way, way deeper because government means all kinds of things. Um, and so then we get our reimbursement. Uh, so let's jump into the hospital. Um, I really like this graphic because it defines how, how hospitals are thinking. Remember, hospitals are purchasing the vast majority of, I'm going to say hospitals and long-term care. Right, same same concept. They they purchase the vast majority of medical devices, um, and, and this is from Advancing Healthcare in Ontario called Optimizing Healthcare Supply Chain, and and this is the mindset. This is how they're thinking of medical devices. So we've got different uh, categories in our pyramid here. We've got indirect commodities, lots of indirect commodities. What's an indirect commodity? Everything in this room is an indirect commodity. It's not impacting patient care, but it's part of the hospital. They paid for it. So they give the chairs, you got the, this, all the, everything in here is an indirect commodity. Uh, direct clinical commodity is just the same thing, but it's, it, it's directly uh, IV tubes or um, uh, hospital beds, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, medical uh, technology. So uh, this could be uh, lasers for cataract surgery or MRIs. Uh, and then we get innovation. So you can see that that uh, there's lots of indirect commodities and then it, it narrows to the top. And innovation is, is really, it's more about solutions, right? So it's, there's nothing else. You're not improving, you're creating something brand new. It's breakthrough innovation they'll often describe it as. Okay, so that's the basic structure. And then in each of those sections, we've got three different shades of blue because you can have a com commodity just means that that there's no patents, everyone's selling the same thing. It doesn't matter if I buy this one or that one, I, I go for price, right? There's no, there's no difference. There's no value offering here. It's the exact same phone. It's just from one store versus the other. So I'm going to purchase on, on price. So that's, that's the blue. And there are commodities within indirect commodities, direct clinical commodities, and within medical technology. But there could also be, so let's take direct clinical commodities. There are hospital beds that are wildly technological and innovative. It's amazing what they are doing. It's a hospital bed isn't just a hospital bed anymore. So it may be that that comes into the, uh, comes into to the light blue because now you're comparing, okay, I've got this hospital bed and I got your hospital bed, but your hospital bed uh, is linked up so I can monitor the patient, for example. Um, another example of a direct clinical commodity is a, a, a startup I'm working with, which is a, it's, it's, it's just a pad that goes on top of the bed, uh, and for patients who, who can't move, it measures when they need to be turned to avoid um, uh, uh, compression um, ulcers, which are nasty, nasty things. Um, so, so he's come up with brand new, never, never been envisioned before, so he's got a solution in, in this category. And you can, go, you can go on, but I think you get the idea. Uh, this is how hospitals are thinking. So. You're going to place yourself on this uh, on this on this uh, triangle, uh, and of course you want to be you want to be in the dark blue, right? That's where you've got problem, big gap, and then solution, right? So your value offering is massive. Okay. 
Um, yeah, it's a good way to think about it. And then the light blue is you've got a smaller, uh, and then the and then the uh, the medium blue there is there's no difference. Uh, money flow is important to understand. So hospitals, LTC, vast majority of uh, medical device purchases. There's lots of other groups as well. This came from the same report, by the way, as a bit of a spider's web. But all you really need to know is that you've got hospitals and LTC for the most part, and then they source it through uh, group purchasing organizations. Uh, so the group purchasing organizations uh, get between the vendor, uh, the company, and the, and the hospital. Um, what um, um, so if, if, if we're looking at hospitals and long-term care, um, you um, need to know that uh, individual hospitals or groups can, can purchase goods and services. Vast majority uh, of purchases are made through buying groups. Yeah, question at the top. Yes. So if you have a medical device, you're going to want to engage early adopter hospitals, right? You're not going to want to go into a community hospital because they've got their way of doing things. They, they're not, they're following what the KOLs, where are the KOLs? The KOLs are in, in your teaching hospital. They're in Sunnybrook, right? So lots of great innovation is, is right here in Sunnybrook and then gets out to the community. So you find yourself a clinical champion within, within Sunnybrook, for example, uh that's that's how you get them you get them excited and then you can take it from there um you identify a nurse or a doctor to champion this is the clinical champion right doesn't have to be a doctor but it has to be somebody clinical who's going to who's going to be the champion within your hospital and that's that's the that's a starting path for uh, that's a starting point for for reimbursement does that answer your question not fully i know cuz it's it, it's good. It's going to depend. It's going to depend on the medical device, and it, not all medical devices, of course, go through go through hospitals. We will talk about that in in a, in a little bit. Um, buying groups. Uh, what what do buying groups do? Why why are there buying groups? Why why are those? Why, why are there? What, no, somebody who hasn't answered yet. Why do we have buying groups? Yes. You can leverage purchasing power. Hey, there we go. Purchasing power. It's all about purchasing power. What? What? Uh, coffee crisp. Guys, you guys are taking all my coffee crisps. God. Um, yeah. So it's it's all about uh, it's all about um, there are other things as well. It's over oversimplifying it, but uh, in essence, we're we're talking about volume purchasing, better pricing from suppliers. Um, we're not going to get into this really, but know these two: Mohawk Med Buy. Health Pro are gigantic. Um, there are a whole bunch of others, but these are the big guys. Um, okay, so that's hospitals and um, uh, and long-term care facilities. It, the the challenge with medical devices is that there's like a lot of places that could potentially get reimbursement. So there is some direct reimbursement from government. Um, so there's increasing area of of home care. And there's something called the assistive devices program. So if you're selling wheelchairs or any any medical device to keep the a patient in in the home longer, home care. So my my friend who's who's uh, well my client that's that's developed this pad to to tell to tell the caregivers when to turn the patient so that they don't get compression ulcers. That's that's a perfect use case, right? To to keep your loved one at home. Uh, rather than the hospital, um, so there's an assisted devices program that'll pay 75%, and then they'll, the patient will get reimbursed. Reimbursed. Um, there's also something called the Ontario Government Pharmaceutical and Medical Supply Service. Uh, so they'll do things like the naloxone kits. Um, who has a naloxone kit at home? And and where did you get it? You got it from medical school. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Who else has? <laughs> Okay, I got my one. Where'd you get yours? Okay, hmm. I got mine from the pharmacy. Uh, and did you guys pay anything? Okay, so and I didn't pay anything either. So I don't know if it's under the same program, but when you go to the pharmacy, if you ask for a naloxone kit, they'll give you a naloxone kit. It's free. There's no no charge. Somebody's paying for that. It's the Ontario government. It's this program here. Um, 
And then there are government funding priorities, as I, as I talked about, that may be something in particular that they're doing that they're trying to accomplish. So you got to keep an eye on, on those things. Alternative payers, there's a whole basket of stuff here. Depend, again, depends on your medical device. There's private healthcare organizations, there's allied healthcare professionals, cooperatists, um, uh, nurse practitioners, there's um, a chiropractors, uh, private insurance companies, of course, there's regional health authorities, hospital charitable foundations. If you're, if you're selling, if your, your medical device is a brand new breakthrough MRI machine for $275,000, you're probably going to talk to the, the, the hospital charitable foundation. You're not, you're, that's, that's where you're likely going to get your, your reimbursement from. Private donors, potentially, uh, direct to consumer. Um, and so uh, that's the other, and I'm going to talk about direct to consumer in a second. I want to talk about billing codes. What the hell is a billing code? Got a medical device and I need a billing code. What's a billing code? Anybody? Yes? That's it. That's it. Got a few left. What do you want? You don't? Okay. Uh, so you're exactly right. So it's billing code. Um, we're basically a fee for service um, uh, healthcare system. It's changing different models as family health teams and some really cool stuff happening. But for the most part, it's fee for service. So I see you in my office. I'm a family physician. I see you in my office. You, you, you're presenting with a wart. Uh, so I see you for 10 minutes. I refer you to the dermatologist and I get 25 bucks. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, a retinal surgeon uh, and I'm going to uh, take out your, uh, your uh, grandmother's or your, your, uh, your, your father's cataract. Uh, you're going to get in there. Uh, you're going to use, um, uh, you're going to use this uh, really uh, fancy laser to, to, to cut the lens. Um, uh, there's a billing code that's associated with that medical device so that the physician can get paid. So if you, the challenge is if you, if you don't have the billing code, I had a client, uh, it was a cardiovascular, um, monitoring, really slick piece of just very small, just clipped on here. Uh, it was like a five or six lead, uh, cardiovascular measurement device. Uh, very, very portable. Um, it's fantastic technology. Wasn't successful in large part because they didn't have the billing code thing figured out. Um, the problem was there was a billing code for, for 24 hour halter monitoring, but it's this big thing and you've got to wear for 24 hours. And I was like 25 bucks or something that the lab got. Uh, they, they couldn't, um, the technology was great, but it was also expensive. And the $25 wasn't economical. They needed a new billing code or an upgraded billing code. They didn't have that, so they didn't get, uh, they didn't get out of the water. Does that make sense? Um, so billing codes. Um, every service has a corresponding billing code, which could include the use of your medical device. Lack of billing code or billing code with inappropriate compensation, as in this monitor, is, is, it's going to be really, really difficult. It discourages the medical device uptake. Yes. Get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of part of your it goes goes back to the reimbursement model, right? So if, if you've got a if you've got a problem over here and a solution over here, okay, you probably are gonna have a faster process of changing that or getting an updated billing code or a new billing code. Um if if it's if it's small, it's you know, it, it could take a couple of years, or you don't get it at all. So this is something this is why I've got this guy here with, you know, don't forget, because this is this is early stage stuff. Gotta be thinking about this is all about the customer, right? Who's paying? So uh, if 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 there's something in that customer uh, that that the physician, for example, that requires them getting reimbursement, you got to you got to understand that pathway at least notionally, so that yeah, we got to get a billing code here. It may not be an issue at all, depending on the on the, on the medical device. Um, and then after spending an hour telling you about reimbursement, I'm going to ask you, do you really want reimbursement? Um, there is this consumer, there's this consumer, um, a consumer, um, option, um, Canada healthcare act. So we don't pay for drugs, thanks. Or, or for medical, um, uh, we don't, we don't pay for medical services because of Tommy Douglas and his efforts. 
uh, something called the Canada Health Act, which which um, it's not quite the right characterization, but in essence, it's the guiding well, it is the guiding principles uh, for that for that healthcare. And so, with that, there's a very very clear line between that which is medically necessary and that which is not medically necessary. That which is medically necessary, the government pays for it. You can't bill the patient anymore. It's illegal to, uh, and so that is very clear. But if it's not medically necessary, uh, wart removal, chiropractor services. Um, let's go back to cataract lenses. So the government pays for that cataract service, uh, the cataract lens, the, the, the cataract to be removed, new lens to put in, great, I can see. Super, government pays for that. Now the technology has come so far that, um, and then the next thing the patient would do would, would be to go and get a new pair of glasses because the prescription is going to be all messed up. So the technology has come so far that you can now go to um, get, get that surgery and have perfect vision. You can be provided perfect vision. My mom was an example of this. So she's worn glasses all her life. She got a cataract replaced. She doesn't have to wear glasses anymore. She still has them there in the glove box because if she gets pulled over, her license still says she has to wear glasses. But that's, that's it. Government doesn't pay for per perfect vision. It pays for the removal and replacement of that cataract lens. So the ophthalmologists have been able to bill patients extra for that upgraded service. So does your medical device fit somewhere in there? Possibly. In which case, maybe you don't want reimbursement because there's a, there's, a, there's a cost to reimbursement. What's the cost to reimbursement? Anybody want to hazard a guess? It was great. I get government reimbursement. What, what's, what, what's the cost? Exactly. You mentioned it earlier, right? The, the $1,000 medical device, you wanted to charge $2,000, but they're only going to pay $1,000. So, ah, so they got buying power. It's, it's, it's as simple as that, right? So from a business perspective, they've got all the buying power. So then somewhere in your business analysis, and we all have to do this with, with healthcare innovation, is, is how, do, how do we be successful with this innovation? We've got to get it to patients. We've got to be commercially successful. So what's the best path to commercial success? Is it reimbursement? Maybe you have to have reimbursement. Maybe there's room on this not medically necessary side. Um, Shoppers is filled with medical devices, by the way, with its, that, that aren't medically necessary. Blood pressure monitors and toothbrushes, and you know, it, it's all they're all over the place, right? Yes. Sorry, say, say, I'm not sure what your question is. It's a consideration. It's a consideration, but the your your I think your it's one of the considerations. I think for me the the main consideration is going to be okay. Who's who is that? Who what, what problem you're solving? What what is what is the customer? Uh, and determining is there is there a play on the non medically necessary side? Uh, if it's a if it's a brand new type of hip for orthopedic surgery, there's it's very clear. You're not, you're not getting, you're, it's, it's not, patients aren't going to, aren't going to, aren't going to pay. You're not going to be able to do that. Uh, and then from an economics perspective, there's a, there's a willingness to pay formula that you may want to consider as well, um, uh, which is simply to say that there's a, a maximum price um, a customer is ready to pay um, versus the, the price of, of the product. So willingness to pay as a, is another, is another factor. Um, that's it for the, that's it for the lecture.